Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Testing, testing, testing. <laughs> testing, testing. Don't be tempted. <laughs> Welcome everyone to Bug a Scientist. I'm Dan here at Imagination Station and I am very excited for today's event. Uh, we have Dr. Heidi Apple and Dr. Jack Schultz here from the University of Toledo to talk to us all about bugs. So without any further delay, Jack and Heidi, take it away. Hi everybody, I'm Heidi. And I'm Jack and we're entomologists. We love Insects. And we study them, that's our job. We need to figure out what we mean by entomology and insects. What exactly do we mean by insects? Well, insects are animals, and the way we tell different ant kinds of animals apart is their body plan. Oh, so there's a plan? There's a plan. So what's it got? Well, let's see, you've got an ant up here. Let's take a look. We have a head, thorax, abdomen, and then we have one, four, five, six. Okay, so six legs. That's an insect. Anything else? Sometimes they have wings. Well, usually two pairs of wings. As you can see in this butterfly hand puppet. Well, you said usually. There, Uh, but flies only have two pair of wings. And let's look at this mosquito. We have two wings on the mosquito. That's all you get on a fly. Oh, so, so it, flies are insects, but they only have two wings. Right. Okay. They're the grand exception. All right. They're pretty grand, some of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're not biting. Well, some of them do, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so in that case, is this an insect? Yes. I see three body parts, head, thorax, abdomen, wings. How many wings? Oh, only two. Uh, yeah, I think this is a fly playing a trick on us. It's colored to look like a wasp, like maybe 
one of the wasps you see at your picnic table in the summer, and it's colored this way so you won't touch it. And lots of flies do this. Uh, they're called mimics. This is called mimicry when they look like something they're not to help protect themselves. What else do we have? Well, that com convinces me. I would leave that alone. Well, this one, this is a, a ladybird beetle. Ladybug, right? And uh, I don't see any wings at all. Ha <laughs> ha, the wings are hidden. They're a little different than beetles. We have the outer wings, which are hardened into wing covers. Mm -hmm. But underneath these, there are normal wings that unfold when the beetle flies. Okay, so there are four wings, but the first two are covers for the second right. two. Right. All right, so when, when that beetle flies, it probably looks like this, right? Yes. Yeah, the hind wings have unfolded, and the front wings are opened up to let them out. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's good. What else do we have to think about? Oh, eyes. Eyes. Yeah, yeah. The, um, the insects definitely have eyes. In fact, some of them have many eyes, but the main eyes that insects have are lovely like yours. Ah, oh, thank you, dear. Yes, and they're quite different from ours. Um, they uh, have many, many parts. Instead of a single eyeball with a, with a lens and a retina like ours, uh, they have many, many, many little eyes, each with its own lens. Each one is called an omatidium. Omatidia is plural. Uh, but some flies have up to 28,000 of these. Uh, and that allows them to see almost as well as we do, or at least pretty well, although not quite as well. Uh, if you think about it, something like a bee has to find a flower and identify it and know where to land. So here's what that looks like to you and to a bee. Uh, that's the way we see it on, on the left. The way the bee sees it is on the right, and you can clearly see that it's a flower, and you can see almost all, the, all of the elements there, including the spider that's waiting to catch us. Uh, but it's not quite as sharp as what we're used to. But insect eyes have another characteristic that's different from ours, and that is they see different colors than we do. We see mostly uh, colors in the, uh, from red to blue, but bees, for example, see into the blue part of the spectrum much farther than we do, and so they can see ultraviolet light, which we cannot see. So if we go back to a flower that a bee may, may be looking for, to us it will look like the yellow flower in the upper left, but seeing it in ultraviolet light, it displays a landing place that tells the bee where the nectar is hidden and where to go to find what it's looking for. Very, very special. Very cool. <laughs> well, so the eyes are pretty interesting, pretty different from our own, but what about ears? Oh, ears. Ears are really different. Um, <clears throat> some of them are a lot like ours. You know, with eardrums that vibrate in response mm -hmm. to sound, uh, but others are completely different. One thing that's really interesting about insects is that ears can be anywhere on an insect. No way. On the abdomen, uh, on the thorax, on the head, on the antennae. Uh, in grasshoppers and katydids, the ears are in their knees, their front, front <laughs> legs. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, a lot of them work the way ours do, but a lot of them don't. Um, and hair, hairs are really important hearing devices for insects. This is the head of a male mosquito, and he's trying to find a female mosquito to mate with, but has to hear her at quite a distance. So these hairs on his antennae are tuned to that obnoxious humming sound that we all hear when we hear mosquitoes humming. Uh, and that tells them where a female is. So in this insect, the ears are actually hairs, which is pretty different from us. Except, you know, we have ears in the very part of our inner ears. But, they, they, but they're pretty different. Yeah. Uh, ears are pretty important to lots of insects. And everybody's pretty familiar with cricket sounds. Uh, that's the sound of crickets, male crickets, trying to find female crickets. Uh, and it's a very, very familiar sound to all of us. These days, these days you can hear that call almost anywhere in the, in the nighttime. Okay. 
in the eastern U.S. these days, people are hearing the outrageously loud sound of cicadas calling. And again, those are cicadas talking to each other, males trying to figure out where females are. Uh, and it's a language. Uh, those high frequencies are, are meaningful to the insects. Now, when you do this kind of communication, there's a risk involved. And if we think about crickets calling again, uh, we find that crickets have enemies. And one of them is a fly that likes to find crickets, lay eggs in the cricket. The egg hatches into a maggot, which eats the, uh, the, kick, the cricket from the inside out. So it's, it's a parasitic fly. And you know how it finds its cricket? No. It listens and follows the sound right to the cricket. Wow. So insects communicate with sound. They have ears for hearing it. Uh, it's meaningful to them, but there is a risk involved. Whoa. So, so the, the, value, the other values to insects of, uh, of hearing uh, include getting away from their predators, avoiding their predators. Um, many of you probably know that bats are out at night using ultrasound, ultrasonic uh, sounds to find moths and other insects flying. In fact, having uh, bats in your yard is probably the best pest control you can, you can ask for. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, bats have ears, uh, and those ears are tuned to the frequencies that bats use to find them. And when the moth hears the bat approaching, it takes maneuvers to avoid it. So it dives, it spirals around, flies away. You know, some moths are distasteful or poisonous, uh, and those moths can make sounds in the bat's language that say, I'm awful, don't catch me, and the bat swerves away. So here's a case where uh, sound, both making it and uh, listening to it, helps you get away from your enemy. Huh, very cool. So that's got me thinking about noses. <laughs> Do insects have noses? Nah. Be real, except on, on silly puppets? Nah. Uh, we can't really find it. I mean, you can call things noses on, on insects, but uh, the, uh, the fact is that they do not breathe through a nose. Uh, instead, they breathe through holes in their sides. Here's a video of a caterpillar breathing. The air is going in and out of those holes in the side of the body, and it's being carried to all parts of the caterpillar through those, those trachea or tunnels carrying the air. Uh, so if you think of the nose as a breathing device, it can be all over an insect, not just on the head. Huh. And in most insects, most insects have these holes in their side, and if you look carefully, you'll find them. What a strange weird? concept to yeah. think about breathing down yeah. my sides. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So I know they do have mouths. And if they're a caterpillar, they are chewing their food mm -hmm. and digesting it. Yeah. yeah, they have things sort of like teeth. Yeah. Uh, our uh, favorite an animal to hate, the mosquito, of course, has. Uh, a kind of beak that in, inserts into our skin to, to suck blood. By the way, uh, only female mosquitoes do this. Male mosquitoes are more interested in uh, nectar and flowers, and of course they're interested in female mosquitoes. <laughs> uh, but a female mosquito can't make eggs unless she has drunk blood, so she really needs to find you uh, and use this beak to penetrate your skin. So six-legged vampire. Six-legged vampire, that's right. Vampire mothers. That's right. But insects do so many different kinds of things. Because they eat so many different kinds of things, right? All kinds of things. So they have all kinds of mouths. And we have a few others uh, depicted here. Tiger beetles run around, catch other insects, and snip them in half and eat them. <laughs> and you can see that it's got just the right tools there in the upper left corner for doing that. As we know, bees drink nectar from flowers. And so they need a relatively long tongue. And we can see that the bee's tongue is perfect for that. Mm -hmm. House flies have a mouth that's really a sponge. Uh, when they detect that there's sugar or something else that's juicy and uh, good to consume, they throw out that sponge of a tongue and, and lap it up. One thing that makes flies sort of unpleasant for us, and we'll talk about this next week, is that that sponge picks up whatever the fly found on the surface that it, that it sponged. 
and that can include disease-causing bacteria and viruses. Blech. So the way flies usually uh, spread diseases around is by lapping them up off one surface and then not washing their mouth out <laughs> before they go <laughs> onto the next surface. Okay. <laughs> And then the, the acorn weevil here really you know, makes us think of the mosquito. Uh, you might think, well, that's a beak for penetrating skin or something. Huh. And, uh, but it's actually, really long. It's really long. It's as long as their body. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but it's actually not a, uh, not a spear or anything like that. It's, uh, it's a drill. At the very tip of that schnoz, uh, there are drill-like teeth. And she uses this to tunnel into acorns. And then she turns around when she's made a tunnel and lays an egg in the acorn, and that turns into uh, another weevil. Wow. So, I mean, just think, drilling through an, uh, an acorn isn't all that easy. That's a lot of work. It is. It is. Yeah. So, uh, bottom line here is that insects have all kinds of different mouths, and you can sort of tell what the insect does for a living if you know what the mouth looks like. Very cool. Well, you know what I'm going to ask you about next. I can guess. Because I know they have them. Yes. And Antennae. Antennae, yeah. Uh, Antennae are uh, a really unique invention in insects. Uh, some other animals have antennae, but insects have really developed antennae into a really incredible tool that they're dependent on. <laughs> uh, the antennae for an insect provides a sense of taste, smell, touch, uh, it, in some insects, it can sense the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, it can help the insect tell up from down. Uh, it has lots and lots of different functions. Wow, it's like a whole bunch of superpowers tucked into one it is. accessory. It is. But the, uh, the easy one to understand and the one we're most familiar with is using antennae to smell. Uh, and here's an example. This is a, a moth. In fact, it's a male moth with really big uh, sort of uh, leafy antennae. And those antennae are designed to find a female. The female of this moth species uh, is emitting a signal, chemical signal into the air. Uh, and these antennae allow this male to fly as much as a mile away to find her. So he's sensitive to only one or two molecules in the air with these antennae. It's a wow. wonderful sniffing device. Just in case you're curious, uh, a lot of us would like to know how to, to determine what's a moth and what's a butterfly. And an easy way to tell is that moth antennae look like the ones we just showed you, but butterfly antennae are these linear filament-like things, usually with a knob on the end. So if you and your friends are out, find something fluttering around, looks like a butterfly or a moth, and you're wondering, you can use the antennae to tell them apart. Wow, very neat. Yeah, yeah. So the, I, I have another question. Mm -hmm. I noticed that a lot of insects are hairy. Not all of them, but a lot of them are hairy. Yep. What's that up? Well, they're hairy all over, including on the antennae. Huh? Okay. And some of those hairs on the antennae are taste buds. No. So, for example, <laughs> when ants are out and about, uh, they're constantly tapping their antennae and the hairs on those antennae against the ground. Tap, 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 tap as they walk along. And what they're looking for is the taste of sugar or something else good to eat. And we take advantage of, of the way they work by offering them sugar in the form of little containers like this one uh, that is laced with uh, insecticide. So these ants were drawn to this through their antennae uh, and they think it's a great source of sugar and they're going to take it home to the nest. And when they do that, they're going to tell their friends that with their antennae that there is this great food source out there and they should all go collect it. And this insecticide works by encouraging ants to come collect lots of it, tell each other to go get more, and then head back to the nest with it. Boy, those are toxic friendships. If, yeah, they are. Uh, <clears throat> but antennae are you know, maybe the most uh, important or at least the most unique characteristic that insects have. So we've learned about all kinds of things that insects have that we have. Yeah, but we, we, we were going to talk about hair. Oh, okay. Hairs on antennae and hairs elsewhere, right. So insects are hairy. The one on the top picture here 
It's covered in hairs. Uh, it may not look like that to us without a microscope, but those hairs have lots of important um, tasks or things to do for the insect. Uh, they, they provide a sense of touch. The insect can tell when it's close to a wall or close to something. Like whiskers. Like on a whiskers on a, or a mouse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also can sniff things, as we were just saying a moment ago, and taste things with those hairs. Um, and those hairs are very sensitive to wind motion. Uh, and so when you try to whack a fly with the fly swatter, you're moving air towards the fly. And because of those hairs, the fly can feel the air coming and is gone before you ever get there. So the fly, the fly may see the, 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 uh, huh. the weapon coming. But for the most part, the fly is feeling it through those hairs, yeah. Wow. The caterpillar at the bottom here uh, is just lovely. Everyone wants to touch this caterpillar, and many people do, only to find that some of the hairs are very, very poisonous. Uh, and another function of some air, hairs on some insects is to sting enemies, including us. Huh. So you've got to watch out even when an insect looks lovely. So like an insect stinging nettle. That's right. It's actually, it's very much like kind that. Kind of That's like right. that. Yep. Huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gosh, so, insects can do a lot of the same kinds of things we do. Mm -hmm. Is there something that they don't have that we have? Bone. Oh, bones, yes. Mm -hmm. They, oh. You're pushing your bones. Oh, yeah, well, my bones are inside. <laughs> there are no bones inside insects. Okay, so what holds them together? Mm -hmm. Well, it's something we call an exoskeleton. Uh, 3CPO here is a robot, although a very smart one, uh, but all of his innards are held together by uh, a shell, the beautiful golden shell he has here. Uh, and that's what holds him up. You see that there are junctions, his elbows and his, uh, his knees, uh, have to be, they have to allow them to move. Joints. They're joints, right, uh -huh. okay. And in fact, insects are part of a larger group of animals called arthropods, which means jointed legs or jointed oh, feet. Like spiders and crayfish. And yeah, stuff. and lobsters. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, this, what this means is that everything you see in an insect is actually formed by this exoskeleton, which is hard, it's water resistant, uh, it, it does lots of things, and everything you see about an insect, its shape, its color, uh, and some of its behaviors, uh, is, is done thanks to this hard exoskeleton. Here are a couple of examples of kind of weird exoskeletons. Uh, the beetle in the lower left uses that horn, to, that's a male, and he fights with other males to gain access to females using that horn. That's scary. Well, for a beetle, <laughs> yeah. Um, and the insect in the upper right, we have no idea why oh, it looks that way. It's so bizarre. Isn't that weird? Yeah, people have tried and tried and tried to explain why it has that thing on its back. Um, and, you know, people keep trying, but nobody has yet figured out what those balls and things are supposed to do. Could it just be beautiful? Yeah, do they and care? Ornaments? Uh, ornaments? Uh, now, ornaments only matter if they help you survive better, right? Right. Well, mm -hmm. maybe they do. I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, you see, they're covered with hairs. Yeah. <laughs> and it could be that there's some sort of sensory device. Ah, like a satellite on top of the body. Yeah, 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 or an antenna mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sort of thing, yeah. yeah. So this presents insects with a problem. How do they grow? They're stuck inside this shell, right? Yeah, and they get bigger inside. They get bigger and bigger and bigger, but the shell can't grow. The shell huh. is solid and it's yeah. fixed. So what has to happen is the insect has to get rid of the shell. Every time it gets too hmm. big for the shell, chemicals inside the, the shell begin to dissolve it a little bit. It gets weak, and then the insect takes a deep breath and blows it apart. Ha! Huh. Yeah. Now, lots of people in the Northeast US are seeing this happening a lot right now. Uh, cicadas have been in the ground for 17 years, uh, and they've been growing, and along the way, their nymphs, which are the immature cicadas, have been shedding skins, but we didn't get to see it. 
But when the most mature nymph comes out of the ground, it wants to turn into an adult, and that's going to be way too big for the skin. So it molts. It softens that shell, and it... That it, exoskeleton. Exoskeleton, mm -hmm. and, and emerges from it. And in this particular case, there are so many of them. There are billions and billions of these insects all over southern Ohio and the, and the East Coast. Uh, that there are literally billions of the baby skins lying about. And here is the collection. Thanks to Dr. Uh, Cipollini at Wright State University, we have a collection of the skins left behind by cicadas when they emerged. So each of these was an immature one that emerged from the ground, climbed up a tree or maybe your picnic table, uh, and the adult emerged by splitting the back and leaving it behind. Huh. So although it might seem that insects are at a disadvantage because they have to do something about this, uh, about this skin, mm -hmm. actually they've taken care of that pretty well. What a strange concept. Yeah, I, I'm glad I don't have to do it. I mean, really, <laughs> yeah. Kids grow out of their clothes all the time, but it's a little easier process. Well, some of these exoskeletons are so strong that you can drive a car over the insect and not squash it. And you know, uh, insect collectors like to put pins through insects and put yeah. them in their box. The, once they've killed them. Once they've killed them, yeah. yeah. Uh, and there's at least one beetle that you can get a pin through because it's so hard. Oh my gosh. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but even that skin has to be sh has to be shed, and uh -huh. I don't know. I think maybe the kids are out there celebrating. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I bet they are. They've made it all the time, yeah. and now they're, they're out. Well, we we've learned about so many interesting things about the way insects are built, about their body plans, so many accessories, all the adaptations they carry around. Yeah, and we just really begun we're at the surface so please join us next time same time same place when we'll try to answer the question why should we care about bugs and in the meantime look at my t-shirt and answer the question is this really an insect <laughs> we'll see see ya bye Heidi and Jack uh, this just in we have some questions from Facebook and I I wanted to share them with you to see if you guys had some answers for us. Um, we have a question here from Valerie. She says, what kind of plants can we plant in our yards to benefit a praying mantis? Uh, actually, a uh, praying mantis is, will eat almost any insect. So, and you probably don't want lots and lots of insects in your garden eating your garden. So the easier way to increase the number of praying mantises in your garden is to order an egg mass online. They're readily available. Uh, the eggs hatch out really easily. Uh, and hundreds of little mantids uh, emerge from this egg mass and distribute themselves through your garden and are happy to eat whatever they can find. Now, it helps to spread these around a bit because they're also happy to eat each other. So you want to you know, sort of distribute your egg masses around the garden. But if, if I were you and I wanted to do this, I'd, I'd invest in some egg masses. They're not very expensive. Oh, very cool. I have another one here uh, from Jenny. She says, since flies can sense the fly swatter coming without seeing it, what is the best way to keep the flies away from you know, things like your food? Well, one of the things we use at home is a fan. So we're outside and we have a, a, you know, a fan on a pedestal and we just have it blowing at us when we're out there. So that's, that's one way to do it. Really, the only way humans have uh, more or less defeated diseases that are transmitted by flies is with screens. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, in countries where people don't use screens, uh, disease rates caused by flies are much greater than our own. River blindness, lots mm -hmm. of diseases. And we'll, we'll be talking about that next week. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you know, you can spray insecticides, but then you risk harming yourself and everybody else. And all the helpful insects, right? And all the helpful insects, right. So the best thing to do is keep the uh, windows and doors closed or screened, I think. And here's a tip if you're going to use the, uh, the fly swatter. 
Uh, as it turns out, researchers have shown that when flies are threatened by uh, a hand or a fly swatter, they always take off backwards. Huh. They tumble back they and then they fly. <laughs> So if you're going to go after one, you want to come at it from behind. But you're going to have to be quick because it'll still feel the air rushing at it. It is so satisfying when you get it though. <laughs> it's, it's worth multiple tries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much, Jack and Heidi. I tell you what, I have learned so many new things about bugs and how they work. Um, we are coming back with our bug scientists series. We're going to be back next Thursday, just like we mentioned earlier. Uh, same place, same time, 6 o'clock, right here, so you can check us out, and we're going to be talking more about bugs. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time.